Hello, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is James Gutman. I am the head of investment portfolios at Dolphin. And uh, I have with me today two of my colleagues, Jeff Wan and Adrian Vandenbach. And we are going to have a, a, a very short informal conversation about a topic that's attracted some of our attention recently, which is uh, the, the state of the credit market and in particular. Um, should you own anything other than high yield if the Fed is buying the market? This is the inaugural run of a new series that we are uh, putting in place during this time of lockdown here at Dolphin, where we will once a week have a, a very informal conversation amongst ourselves, which we'll share with our, with our clients and our friends. And um, this will be an opportunity to, to let people know what we're thinking about and how, these might, uh, how this might affect their, um, their portfolios or their, their, their thoughts about the, the market more generally. So just to kick things off, um, we've seen a lot of action over the past weeks and months. Um, I think that's, that's something that people are fairly well, well aware of. And one of the things that has caught my attention in particular is the extent to which the central banks have been intervening in order to provide support and protection for, for the credit markets. And in particular, something happened last week, which I thought was quite unusual. Um, the Federal Reserve stepped in and, uh, and launched a set of initiatives targeting a segment of the credit market, which I don't think they've targeted before. So Adrian, I was wondering if you could very quickly run through what the Fed did last week and why that's significant. Sure. Um, I think it's worth stepping back a little bit more. It wasn't yeah. just last week. They actually started the process on March the 23rd when they announced for the first time in history that the Fed would buy investment grade corporate bonds. This is something that the ECB has done before to help the European companies, but the Fed has always backed away from really assisting directly or intervening within a market um, directly. Now, their first announcement obviously caused credit spreads to um, come back in, yields to go lower, and this happened almost immediately. But last week, the real nuance, and this is where a lot of people got confused and started thinking they're buying high yield now, you should buy high yield, was that they announced that they would be buying names which have been downgraded to high yield directly themselves as well. So downgraded from investment grade to high to yield. To high yield, yeah. Okay. So people do that to mean they're buying high yield. Right. What they've done is effectively said, if you're high yield, as of March the 22nd this year, before we made our first announcement to buy IG, we're still going to support you. We are still going to be there to provide you with liquidity, solvency. They're doing this by having two facilities available to them. The first is a $500 billion primary market facility, which allows them to basically, the initiative to go and borrow money from them directly in the form of a bond. Okay. It's a backstop to private um, equity, shall we say, private capital. The other one is to say existing bonds, if your spreads are going out, will come in and buy up to 250 billions worth of bonds in the IG space, including these fallen angel names. Yep. Okay, so, so, the Fed's get, so the Fed's got 500 billion of, uh, primary, of support for primary uh, names in the fallen angel space. Not primary names, primary issuance by the issuers. So oh, effectively, right. when companies need new money to refinancing maturing debt, or potentially even if they need some capital in the short term, to tie right. themselves over. And what, and what kind of criteria does the Fed use uh, in, in, in defining who they're willing to give the money to? This is where it gets a little bit interesting because they haven't really been very specific and there's a lot of gray areas, which you know, Jeff and I have been discussing. But the first one, they've said, we're excluding any banks. Banks have their own facilities available to them. Any companies which have been included or taken care of because of the CARES Act, mm -hmm. are excluded as well. But more crucially, they've said, we're only really targeting the US issuers, the US companies, the people who will give jobs directly to Americans in the US. 
So you can see why they're looking after the big companies, the Fords of this world, the General Motors of this world, that won't be selling anything for a while. They'll be looking to keep these companies alive to survive and reduce their default probability. Now, Jeff, you've been looking at this sort of issue of restriction, haven't you? That's right. So the devil is always in the details. And I guess it helps being a credit analyst since we're used to reading 600 page covenants uh, for the bonds that we do buy. Now, uh, looking at the eligible universe of bonds uh, that have a maturity between one and five years, uh, that comes between 1.7 and 1.9, depending on whether you include utilities or not. Now, the gray areas Adrian had already alluded to is actually the domicile of the companies. Now, We've heard a lot of chatter from analysts and uh, investor consortiums already asking the Fed to clarify what it means by a company that is domiciled in the US. And we've been tracking the fallen angels this year so far and which ones are actually uh, eligible to be, which of their bonds are actually eligible to be bought by the Fed. Now we've had Occidental Petroleum and Synovus uh, they were downgraded prior to that cutoff date of the 22nd of March, so they went to fit the bill. Also, ZF Friedrich Schaffen, the German auto supplier, and also Marks and Spencers, uh, the UK retailer, neither of those are uh, headquartered in the US, so we don't think they will fit the bill either. And then you've got two sectors that are directly receiving financial assistance from the uh, federal government. First, you've got hospitals. Um, their preparation costs have gone through the roof. You know, they're hiring more nurses, more physicians, more practitioners. And um, the government has already said that they would reimburse uncompensated COVID-19 care since um, all patients must be treated in emergency rooms uh, through federal legislation. Uh, and then separately, the airlines. Now, they've they're going to receive uh, assistance through uh, salary um, compensation, um, or assistance rather, uh, holidays to fuel tax, and Delta Airlines, which is one of the names that has been downgraded, um, it won't be eligible. And then there's also uh, Macy's. Now Macy's has no 2020 debt. So if it decides to issue new bonds, to refinance, say it's 2021 bonds or it's 2022 bonds, um, will that be eligible under this program since none of this debt is uh, expiring or maturing within the next three months? So there's still a lot of questions out there. and We expect the Fed to come out imminently and actually reassure the market and provide more answers to these questions. And we want to help our clients navigate uh, through this uh, and rather than blindly buying or fallen angels thinking about their eligible. So that's a pretty restrictive set of, um, of criteria and, 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 and each one of them, I think, you know, has a, has a story or a narrative around it that makes sense. Are there limits to the amount of money that the Fed is willing to put into uh, any given name? Um, yes, basically each issuer can only draw up up to $11 billion or 10% of their outstanding debts as of March 20th. So obviously, if you're one of the bigger companies, you may have 100 billion of debt outstanding already, then you can grow up to 10 billion, fine. But if you're a company which has been very prudent in your debt management, you're actually not gonna be benefiting that much because let's say your company like Microsoft, which doesn't actually have that much debt out there, you may want to run this facility, but you know what? You'll only be able to draw one or two billion. Right. Um, you know, this is where I think the Fed has tried to do something which is more to shore up sentiment. They've looked at what's happened to credit spreads. They've seen the financing costs of companies, doesn't matter who you were, actually shoot up because of the COVID crisis, that they've said, okay, we've got inverted credit curves. What can we do to resolve this credit curve, give assistance to these companies and get them back to a normal credit environment, get investors to carry on holding their debt, buy their debt. And they've done this by saying, you know what, we're going to be the biggest buyer out there if no one else will be. So it sounds, so it sounds to me like, like there could be some misunderstanding 
amongst the investment community. When you see that $750 billion headline figure, you know, 500 in the primary market and 250 into the secondary market, and then you start looking at the, you know, exclusions, it's not actually 750 billion of liquidity that's being added. It's a $750 billion dollar uh, backstop that's being provided in order to reassure markets so that other investors can more comfortably provide the liquidity that's needed to get uh, a fallen angel through the hard patch, uh, you know, a Ford Motor Company, for example, just through a, a tough period. Yeah, I'm saying it's not just Ford, it's any large company which is sort of um, job creative in the US. Right. Um, they know these guys may be for basically laying off employees, they're trying to maintain them and encourage them to maintain them, provide them with some liquidity and solvency to get through the next three months, the next six yeah. months, without necessarily having to draw down their credit lines, which is what we saw before um, everything really erupted. We saw Boeing doing this as much as possible. You know, it's the big companies that are trying to make sure are in a solid place. But what they've done is effectively said to me, how's their PM within the credit space, you know what, you can safely go and buy certain companies. You can buy the majority of the RG space and know if things really blow out, we'll be there to make sure these companies survive. So my default risk on these companies, is going to be low. My loss of ca permanent capital is going to be low. I may get much market volatility, but it'll come back. And what you've seen this was the ECB. When they came out, started buying issuer bonds, we saw spreads compressing down towards more government levels as well. Very low sort of credit spreads. Okay, so you, you, you sort of raised then the question as to what, what, what will the long-term uh, or the short, medium, and long-term impact here be on, um, on spreads, uh, both in investment grade and in, and in high yield. So maybe, maybe talk me through that a little bit. So what yeah, what sure. is going to happen? For me, I see the safest area to invest in is now within the IG universe, especially the strong US issuers. So names like Apple, Lockheed Martin, these are companies which will continue to survive. They'll continue producing in the US after this crisis. They may actually come out stronger at the end of this. Okay. Other companies, which we may have had a question about whether there's survivability, are going to survive now, as long as they've got the right rating. So we're talking about the Fords, where Jeff and I have been discussing Ford beforehand and saying, you know what, do we really want to be owning an auto manufacturer? They're already facing a tough business environment. Are they going to survive through this? But now the government is saying, you know what, we'll provide enough to keep, get them going for the next, I don't know, one year okay. as well. Um, and overall, the credit spreads, I see them compressing downwards. There's a lot of room for IG spreads still to come in. And that's where we're positioning ourselves. Within the high yield, once this move in IG has happened, we expect the next move would be within the nuanced have triple Bs, which may go to form angel status. The names like Ford, which Jeff, I'm sure, will be willing to talk more about. Um, you know, leaving aside the other, let's say, names like maybe T-Mobile, which aren't going to be supported by the US as such. Um, and then the high yield. Remember that if rates stay low, there will be a massive search for yield within the fixed income space by the pension funds, the people's insurers with asset liability management programs. We've seen this happen inside Europe massively, and we can see this happening again. And one of the things we've got to remember is that with the companies having to take on more debt through this credit crisis, not credit crisis, COVID crisis, sorry, there's too many crises these days, well, I think the whole point is to avoid a credit crisis, isn't it? Exactly. But what I'm saying is that because they're taking on more debt, these companies, their ability to service that debt is fine with their current cash flows, with their potential earnings in the future, but it'll keep on eating away on their free cash flow afterwards. So what we end up with is a state where companies can't grow, but also the Fed may not be able to raise rates because the sensitivity to increasing rates will increase. And I think at this point, it's good for Jeff to talk about something like Ford, which encounters quite a lot of these problems where they've seen their EBITDA increases everything. Jeff, Ford? Yeah, so, so if we actually take a step back and try to assess uh, overall fallen angel risk, we can see that the size of the triple B universe has increased by threefold to 3.3 trillion since uh, the global financial crisis of 2008. 
Now that figure is actually three times the size of the total high yield market, which is why there's a lot of concern about whether high yield investors and fund managers would be able to absorb that amount of supply. Um, now the Fed is trying to help triple B rated issuers with their refinancing needs, but it can't really help to improve free cash flow or EBITDA. The companies are on the road there. And now putting on my rating agency hat. Now, if you think about the rating agency's methodologies, liquidity is only one component that they look at. It's usually around 10% of their overall uh, criteria. They also look, as, look at and assess um, the sustainability of revenue streams, the diversification of the company's products, competition in the space, cyclicality, free cash flow and leverage as well. Um, so while we think the Fed's move to support triple B rated companies is extremely supportive, that's not to say that there'll be no downgrade risk looking ahead uh, for, through the next 12 months. Now, Ford is a very good example because Moody's were ahead of the curve and they'd already downloaded, downgraded them to double B earlier last year. Now, we can see that um, given the expectation that it could be fully downgraded by the other two rating agencies, S&P and Fitch, a lot of high yield investors have already started to include them in their portfolios, which is why it traded like a crossover name, somewhere between triple B and double B. Now, as we reach the crisis, we can see in this chart here that spreads on the benchmark for 2026 bonds had reached into what we call distressed territory where credit spreads were north of 1,000 basis points. And I think this is where alarm bells really started to ring for the Federal Reserve. Um, they were worried about a really significant uh, industry, automotive, uh, that contributes to the US economy, uh, which is also a very large employer. And it wasn't surprising to us that the Fed stepped in after they saw this. Um, Fed, uh, the Ford had already been uh, troubled before this, as I say. They were facing a slowdown in uh, total passenger vehicle sales as the US reached an end of uh, another replacement cycle. And also they had embarked and launched a lengthy and costly restructuring program as well. And these were all expected to uh, negatively impact the credit profile of Ford. And what we expect from here, coming back to what uh, Adrian had said, is that we're going to expect to see a bifurcated double B market where you've got recently downgraded fallen angels and future fallen um, angels, GM potentially, ArcelorMittal uh, potentially another one, which will be supported by the Fed. Then you've got existing double B companies which won't be supported through the uh, corporate credit facility program that the Fed has just announced. So it essentially divides the market into what we would call haves and have nots. Okay, so it sounds um, then, I'm sorry, go ahead, Adrian. Well, I was just gonna say, I think one interesting thing about this chart, Jeff, um, something that you need to sort of bear in mind is when we look at the future refinancing costs of companies like Ford, we can see that before they were paying, you know, for the 26s, if they had to issue at the start of the year, they're probably paying around 4% coupons, correct? Mm -hmm. But now, if they had to issue tomorrow, they'd be paying close to about, what, 8.5%, I would say. So their financing costs have actually doubled. And this is something that the Fed has to take into mind, that these companies may be now having to finance at much higher levels than they did three months ago. And the reason why it's double here is because, uh, first off, the, 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 the spread in, the, in both investment grade and high yield has surged as a result of the, the COVID-19 recession, the lockdown crisis, et cetera. But on top of that, Ford has gotten the double blow of falling from IG into high yield and investors demanding an extra pickup on, in order to carry that debt. Yep. So, the Fed is really trying to work two different pieces here. They're trying to bring investment grade and high yield spreads back in uh, to historical norms to relieve some of that funding pressure on firms. But they're also trying to help companies like Ford, which are experiencing that short-term shock 
from potentially slipping from one category into another. And that's the blowout, I think, that, that, yeah. we, that we're in and, this Exactly. And the one thing which I would sort of um, really sort of question about whether or not the Fed is going to be doing this is if the Fed is saying that Ford is a triple B company and should be funding at triple B levels, the market is pricing them has double B levels. So would it make sense for Ford to actually go to the Fed and say, we want to borrow directly from you to three billion, which they can easily do given the size of Ford's um, debt outstanding. It's way of 100 billion, if I remember rightly, mm -hmm. at triple B levels rather than financing at this double B levels in the market, even though they have to pay the Fed 1% for that facility. And it's crucial that companies like Ford keep their cost of financing low mm -hmm. because with 5G soon to be deployed, it needs to invest in research and development into connectivity, it also needs to invest in its uh, autonomous driving technology, and there's also uh, electrification with the soon uh, to be deployed infrastructure for electric uh, vehicle charging stations. It's an area that Ford has lagged some of its competitors. So it needs to keep its cost of financing down if it's to fund all of this future investment and secure the competitive positioning of the company in the future. Yeah, and this is why I think, you know, we will be looking a bit closer at Ford, especially for potentially putting into our portfolios, because what we could see is that the market may be pricing it has a double B rated entity at the moment, but when they do go to the primary market, to the Fed, you finally find they're financing at triple B levels, which may cause a major compression of spreads. As people realize, I'm getting actually excess return on Ford. It's a triple B company, thanks to the Fed, rather than a double B company by the rating agencies. Right which opens up opportunities for uh, credit, credit specialists like yourselves. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you, Jeff, that you, that you mentioned um, Ford's need to maintain its investment program in order to deal with uh, uh, the rollout of 5G and connectivity and, and the, the expansion of the EV space. Um, as you're well aware, we're, uh, we're preparing to, uh, to release uh, some research here at Dolphin uh, on exactly those kinds of infrastructure themes. Um, so, uh, I, I encourage everybody to keep an eye out for for when those when those pieces become in, available in the coming days and weeks. Adrian, you touched on something very briefly, and I kind of want to go back in the conversation to it because I think it's really really important. Um, we were talking about the Fed and what they're doing, and you mentioned the ECB, and you mentioned uh, you might have mentioned the BOJ as well um, as having gone down maybe not the same path but paths in order to support the credit markets uh, that, they, that they have in, in, under their jurisdiction. Can you talk a little bit about the experience they had um, and maybe what kind of exit strategies we, we, we would be able to glean from this? Yeah, I wish you, um, everyone knew what exit strategy would be. Um, we know that the Fed is planning to hold anything they buy until maturity. You know, they may be buying through ETFs. So if they're buying an ETF and holding to maturity, doesn't make sense. Um, so I don't think there's really an exit strategy that's been thought out, just like there's been no real exit strategy created for the QE programs. In fact, every time there's an economic downturn or things look worse, they've had to increase their balance sheet. They've tried tapering, they've tried raising rates, but there's been tantrums at times, and they found the sensitivity to raise rates has been very low. The ECB, which is really the first to buy corporate bonds, have actually said, you know what, we can't do anything here. We have to increase the program. We've had to increase our issue limits. They've concentrated on the IG space. And we also had names which went into high yield within the um, holdings of the ECB, but they just held them. They didn't sell them or anything. So what have we shown is they're sort of more of a passive buy to hold, buy to maturity investor. And we expect the Fed to be the same. We expect that the program, even though they're saying it's not permanent, we become almost like a permanent feature. And that's why we are buying alongside the Fed. Yeah. We're co-investing with the Fed. Yeah, we might as well co-invest with them. You know, after all, they can influence the market. They can print as much dollars as they want to actually buy the entire credit market if they wanted to. But are, are we worried to nationalize it? Are we, are we worried about the Fed changing the economic incentives that, uh, that face firms? I mean, you know, one of the terms you hear a lot with respect to the Japanese is the zombification of the Japanese yep. economy, you know, firms which 
sadly probably should die, um, but that are kept on life support indefinitely. Well, that's the basis of what, we, you know, Jeff and I and you have all been taught that good companies will survive through recessions. They will actually come out stronger. Bad companies are weeded out the economy and the economy actually is more productive and grows faster because of it. Japan's had the issue where they've actually kept companies alive and they've done it by actually buying equities now. That's their only method and they own the majority of the equity markets for Japanese companies now. This for me is a big issue, but you know, as an investor, I'm getting yield here. Right. I'm happy with that yield. My concern is that these zombie companies doesn't lead to any growth. We're stuck in a low yield environment continuously, which means that returns going forward are not going to be as high as people hope for or want. You know, we're seeing this in Europe where I would say the Fed is going into a Europeification mode, which is doing everything they can to support the economy, to support the large companies, keeping them alive, even if we should let them go down or be taken over in a sense. Yeah. Difficult. The debt leverage ratios are going up and it's going to make it harder for these companies to finance growth going forward. All their cash flow and earnings going forward. It's not going to dividends. They'll be going to paying their debt, not to repay it, but to pay the interest payments, to pay for their um, refinancing costs as well. You yeah, know, Jeff, so I think you're- That, works, that, that raises, that raises as well. a lot of longer term, a lot, a lot of longer term questions. Um, Jeff, I, sorry, I just, it occurs to me as, as, as we're having this, this sort of conversation about, um, uh, about these long term impacts and what this might mean. But Adrian said something, you know, quite interesting, which is that we're investors and our job is to get yield. Uh, can you can you tell me how how have these moves by the Fed changed your investment strategy? What are you doing? What are you going to be doing differently now? Sure. So these nuance in the credit market have created dispersion um, across the credit spectrum and also plenty of dislocation opportunities as well. Uh, coming back to what Adrian said about our preference for cash-rich companies, we do like um, pharmaceutical companies in the triple B space, especially those that are well diversified geographically and also through their um, product lines where they treat a number of therapeutic areas from chronic illnesses to um, over-the-counter products. Um, we also think that the pharma companies are... Um, better um, adapted or, or better suited, sorry, to survive this crisis. They've historically been very defensive and we think the impact of COVID-19 is limited and will be manageable. But there are risks that pertain to uh, supply chain disruption. Uh, there were concerns whether pharmaceutical companies would still be able to obtain uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, uh, medical supplies and raw materials. But with uh, Chinese production largely having come online, some of those concerns have been uh, relieved now. And medicine has always exhibited relatively inelastic demand. And we haven't seen any pricing pressure or any volume pressure so far. Uh, and then coming back to what Adrian said about uh, companies that provide public services, we also like uh, the packaging companies, which also inhabit that crossover triple B, double B space, especially those that provide uh, metal and glass. These are sustainable substrates um, for the food and beverage sector, particularly pantry items, which I'm sure we've all uh, stock loaded on. Uh, so that includes, you know, your Campbell's soup, uh, but also um, some other products such as masks, sanitizers, disinfectants, they all require packaging. And this space is historically very cash flow generative. And I think it will be looked upon uh, favorably as we uh, continue to navigate this troubling and tough market environment. That's really interesting. So, so, so effectively the Fed has, has sort of increased or unlocked opportunities uh, in, con in names that would otherwise be interesting for their intrinsic uh, core businesses, but that now have sort of a bit of an extra uh, layer of nuance because of this crossover effect and the, the potential impact of the Fed. Um, guys, it, this has really been a, a great conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been extremely helpful. And 
I, I want to thank as well all of our, our, our friends and our clients who um, who've taken the opportunity to, uh, to participate or to watch uh, this conversation. This is going to be a more regular occurrence. Uh, we're going to try and do one of these uh, on a topic of interest uh, once a week. I invite any any of our um, any of our clients who have a, a particular question that they wanted to uh, to uh, to have us explore to mention this to to their relationship manager, or you can uh, you can email me directly at james.gutman at dolphin.com. Um, and we'd be happy to uh, to take it on board. Again, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll we'll look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you.